Welcome to um, <coughs> our CIPD session on menopause in the workplace. Um, so we are the central London branch and hopefully we really, really hope that you're going to enjoy um, the session that we've got for you. Just before we get started, we've just got some general Zoom etiquette, um, just to remind everyone since we're doing life via Zoom now a little bit more than we used to. So when you're all getting brought in, you'll be brought in on mute. And if you can please stay on mute uh, throughout the session, that would be great, just so that we're um, making sure that we're not um, interrupting our speakers. Um, we do actively encourage you to get involved. We want this to be a really, um, really helpful session for you all. So actively encourage you to submit questions <laughs> via the chat. And my lovely colleague, Sophie is going to be monitoring that chat for you and we will have a session at the end where we will be taking um, any questions over to our speakers as well. So please do actively use the chat box. Thank you so much. Um, so just a little introduction to ourselves. Um, I'm hopefully um, this is not the first event that you have all joined. I'm sure um, there has been maybe some of the other uh, London CIPD branches that you have joined. Um, so the central branch, we're one of seven within the London area. And just this slide, just to give you a little overview of some of the sessions and some of the, the topics that we've been covering in those sessions um, over 2021, uh, 2022. So we have been doing most of these um, online hopefully this year we're going to start being able to do a few more things in person it would be great uh, to actually see and interact with people again but um, if you want to follow us as well on LinkedIn and Twitter we have got our um, Twitter and LinkedIn names just down at the bottom of the screen so obviously we're still into the beginning of uh, 2022 we've got a lot more events um, that are going to be coming up as the year goes on so hopefully there'll be some things of use or interest to all of you on the session And what is this session? What have you come to join today? Obviously, there has been a lot of talk about um, talk about uh, women and this week with International Women's Day. And what we're bringing you today is a nice interactive panel session with um, so hosted by myself and as I mentioned, my colleague Sophie, who's going to be monitoring the chat box as the session goes on. And our two speakers, we have Bev Thorogood, who is a menopause uh, specialist trainer. And we also have Emma Skeets as well. And she is an author and and blogger. Um, so uh, Bev, uh, she's Menopause uh, Specialist Director of Floresco Training Limited, and they provide a specialist training for businesses on menopause within the workplace. And Emma Skeets, as I mentioned, she is an author, um, she writes the Facebook and Instagram pages, Menopausal Mayhem Mothers, and she's also written a book as well called Confessions of the Menopausal Mayhem Mother. So we're going to have some nice um, kind of interaction between the two of them during this session and some different viewpoints coming in as well, which hopefully um, will give a bit of a different stance on how we as an HR community look to support our businesses and our employees with menopause at work. So welcome both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, nice to obviously have you both joining our session. And just before we head over to the panel slide, could you go to the next one? Thank you, Sophie. So why are we here? Why are we talking about menopause in the workplace? Um, so, you know, just, this is a slide of a little bit of stats. So I won't go into too much breaking down detail for that. Um, but essentially, it's, a, it's something that is going to impact or will either does or will impact such a huge portion of our workforce in the working world. And if we look at some of the stats here, this is such a considerable number of individuals who are going to be impacted in some manner by the menopause at work. So what we're really hoping that you're going to get out of this session is some practical takeaways, some insights as to what it actually means for individuals and what they experience and what we as HR can be doing to really help support our business managers and our organizations as a whole to ensure that we are actually tapping into this, um, this amazing resource of individuals we have at, who are potentially at a stage in their life where they are starting to experience the menopause and what that means for them. So ladies, thank you so much for joining. Um, and yeah, it's great to see you so, so early on a Monday morning as well. Um, like, like I said, I would love for you both to be able to kind of give your independent and very unique viewpoints on this topic. But first of all, I just want to get started with why do employers need to actually take the menopause at work so seriously? So I'm going to direct that to you, Bev. 
I think the stats speak for themselves, 900,000 women every year leaving the workplace. And I was one of those stats. I don't like being a statistic, but I am. Four years ago, I left a very long career with the MOD um, because I wasn't coping with menopause. There was no education. My line manager, as brilliant as he was and supportive as he was, didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue what I was going through. It was a bit of a train crash. So I think, you know, Four years later, I'm running and managing a a reasonably successful business. And I think there's this almost a potential stereotype that women, as they're going through menopause, are high maintenance. They need a lot of work. You know, they're they're, they're beyond their best. And it's just not true if if employers can do just a little bit to support them. And actually, I say a little bit because it doesn't need much. In reality, it doesn't take a lot. But they wouldn't be losing that valuable female talent. And, you know, we've got... We've got so much more to bring than just menopause. We've got years of experience and wisdom and it's costly and it could be expensive and they could end up in tribunal. So there's lots of reasons. But the obvious one is because we're just having a bumpy road and we could stay in the workplace and be valuable. Fab. Thank you. And, and Emma, um, I'd love to hear your insights as well, obviously coming from what it is that you do. Well, um uh, f- from my perspective, um, as, as you mentioned, I, I, I'm a blogger um, and I, I, I'm referred to, generally speaking, as the happy accident. Um, I just started to write um, about my experiences on the menopause um, from a semi sort of humorous point of view, but also from a very realistic point of view. Um, I also left the workplace um, during the menopause, didn't realise that that was the reason that I did leave my particular job. Um, And the general consensus is that women need to talk about this and they also need to be understood. But I think initially um, it's helping them to understand themselves as well. Um, And as Bev said, um, you know, women in the workplace, we are phenomenal. Um, And especially to be um, from 40 onwards, we've got this incredible wealth of experience. Um, And it's utterly tragic that just a, um, and as Bev referred to it as a bumpy road, um, I I couldn't agree more. It's it's very difficult to understand, but that's where the education part comes in. And how do women best educate themselves? They talk, they talk amongst themselves, they talk to other people. And so it's opening that conversation, but it's also withholding, it's keeping women within the workplace. We are invaluable. I mean, I, I talk about World Domination Day, um, where we're going to take over the world, because at the end of the day, we, 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 may, we are unique in so many ways. We are incredible as women. Um, and so for any business, you want to hang on to us. You really do, because we have unique sets of skills. Um, and to lose us just because of the very natural phase that we go through, it's it's all about education. It's all about finding solutions. And it's all about really realizing this is not a disease. It doesn't need to be seen as negative because there are things out there that you can do to help as an employer, but also the ladies can help themselves as well. But it's breaking down the stigma in my mind. No, absolutely. And like you say, it's something that, you know, it, it's it's so it's a natural occurrence um, and it's something that, you know, it part it's part of the employee life cycle as well. So, you know, we look at mental health and well-being. Where does menopause sit in terms of that dialogue within the workplace? Um, so in terms of the kind of challenges that women do face, can you shed a little bit more light on exactly what that looks like for for women going through menopause, what the experience is, Emma? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the menopause is really insidious. It's a very clever little um, moment in time. Um, it can creep up on you um, in your early 40s. You can have regular periods um, and then suddenly all, um, you're, you get broken sleep. Um, you are very anxious. You suddenly have very, very low moods. Your memory starts to um, disappear and fail you. Um, and with all these things going on at the same time, women become very frightened. Um, and actually, it's a really simple thing. Your hormones are doing some kind of mad dance. That's all that's happening. It's a very physiological point of uh, sort of what's happening within your body. But how that manifests itself is that women can suddenly feel very frightened. Um, they, they lose a sense of self where they used to be terribly confident, um, where they used to feel very empowered. They suddenly feel like parts of themselves are literally just disappearing. Um, 
And so I think what's really important from an employer's perspective is, first of all, to be able to recognize that there is a behavior change, there's a mood change, there's a slight, um, you know, the, the lady may become, seem troubled, um, but also to remember that she might not know what's going on with her. She would have got possibly gone to her GP with, just as an example, and this is a huge example, I have I have 300,000 followers and I, and, I, and I get this a lot. Women think that they're going into early onset dementia. That is how the menopause can feel. And you don't, you have no idea you're going into it. You go and speak to your GP and your GP will say to you, you're depressed, you're anxious, and they will dish out pills left, right and center that are meaningless. So educating um, people from an HR perspective is invaluable. For the lady because you can educate them and help them to understand what they might be going through but also to help them tackle their general practitioner or um so yeah what is essentially happening within a woman's body is that she stops producing estrogen and her progesterone levels shoot upwards her testosterone starts scraping along the floor and this has so many effects on a woman's not just her physical body but on her emotional well-being her mental well-being and it's a really scary time and I think one of the hardest parts is as I said it's insidious women don't even realize that they are going into this and so that education is imperative and once we start understanding what's going on within our bodies and why it's happening we can then find solutions but it's also opening the dialogue so for any person in human resources who can spot this a mile off mm -hmm. and see what's going on and think okay it's then how do you address that with that individual um, and it's a you know I, I've got some amazingly brilliant ideas how to do it but that that's for Q&A perhaps but yeah that's it is not an illness, it's not a disease. And also it is not an old lady's disease. That's really, really important. I think I'm menopausal and proud. I've been menopausal and proud for a very long time. I went into it surgically and actually we've made it this far. It's an amazing time of our lives and it doesn't have to be awful. And it doesn't, it most definitely mustn't be embarrassing. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing time. Oh, perfect. Thank you. And and Bev, I just I want to touch on some of your your previous work experience as well, because you said you actually left the workplace mm. to um, due to um, the, the menopause and what that situation ended up being for you. Um, would you like to kind of give us a bit of context as to that? Yeah, absolutely. So I joyously got my first hot flush on my 50th birthday, along with a big badge saying I was 50 in case I forgot. Um, but to re in reality, I thought that was the start of my menopause journey because I was poorly educated. I didn't realise that actually, exactly as Emma said, for six years, I'd been feeling anxious, feeling uh, much more stressed, the brain fog, um, it's just forgetting simple things and, and not really understanding why. Erratic periods, all of those insidious symptoms that Emma mentioned, I didn't I didn't recognize them as menopause, but come 10, 50, hot flush arrived. And I thought, yeah, this is it. What actually happened in the following two years? I'd just changed jobs. I'd taken on a brand new role. Um, I was managing people. I was in a, I was realistically, I was in a job that I wasn't suited to, but I was really struggling. I was struggling to learn new things. And I'd always been quite, even if it was something I didn't really enjoy, I could pick it up, I could do it, but I was really struggling. And the more I struggled, the more I sort of was forgetting appointments. I was forget, I'd go into a meeting and walk out and forget who'd been in the, in the meeting. It was that bad. And the, the fear of the early onset dementia was real. So struggled with that for two years. And then I actually asked the MOD for 12 months and paid leave because actually what also happens for a lot of women and for a lot of men in general as well at that sort of age, that sort of 40s, 50s age is, We've got a whole load of other stuff going on in life. You know, we were caring for a, a very sick relative who was disabled. We were their primary carers. My daughter had just had a baby. She was a single mum. My husband was leaving the Air Force. There was so much going on. And, and that's my unique story. But most of us have stuff going on at that time. Elderly parents, all that kind of thing. So it was a bit of a stress fest, if I'm honest. But I didn't recognise it. And I didn't want to go off sick. Uh, I didn't want to go off sick with stress. Um, 
So I'd asked for 12 months unpaid leave, but I didn't cite menopause because I didn't know that that was what it was um, because of financial uh, constraints at the time, the MOD rejected it. And I felt backed into a bit of a corner where I had no option but to resign, which with hindsight, had I kind of understood what was going on and I'd been able to go and get some decent help from a GP. And that's a whole other story because actually I did go and see a GP and they told me I was too young at 50. Um, so there's lots of factors going on. Uh, so it, it, it was hard and I, I left um, and I still struggle, you know, I still forget, forget things. I still have the brain fog. But just not having the pressure of, of having to feel like I'm wearing a mask and performing is quite exhausting when you don't feel like you're performing well. So there's, you know, Emma talked brilliantly about, you know, it has to start with just normalising this, making the, the ability to talk about what you're feeling a non-shameful thing, because there was a lot, of, an awful lot of shame around the fact that I'm not coping, I'm not, I'm not performing as well as I should be and a lot of that was perception I don't think I was failing certainly the feedback I got from my boss was that I wasn't failing but that's irrelevant if you feel it one thing I just would just like to say though and, and sort of following on from what Emma's saying we need to also not make the assumption that every woman who reaches sort of midlife is going to be symptomatic um, so there's an assumption that because a woman is of a certain age, she's going to show menopausal symptoms. A quarter of women don't have any symptoms that are noticeable enough for them to even you know, recognize uh, that there's a problem or that they're going through menopause. So I think there's a danger that we don't, we don't want to make an assumption that if somebody is struggling, it's menopause, but we can't afford to ignore the fact that it could be. Um, and that's a fine balance. It is a fine balance. So what do you think then that uh, businesses should be conscious of, um, you know, to ensure that they are understanding that balance? I think initially it's got to start long before an individual has got a problem. And that means actually as an organisation being really, really clear that it's OK to talk about menopause. It's OK to ask for help and you're not going to be disadvantaged or judged in any way that as a as an organisation, they recognise that menopause is a, a real uh, issue for, for many women, but not all women. And I guess that comes from a, a, a bit of a multifaceted approach by making sure that good training is in place, the awareness is there, that there's a, a policy potentially, although that's not mandatory, but at least guidance documents, something that gives the message to everybody that as an organisation, we recognise that the issues around menopause are real, and it's okay in this organization to talk about it. And then what that does, if, if that is in place, when somebody does have an issue, they feel much more safe to be able to, to step up and speak to their boss or speak to HR and get the help that they need. And Emma, just in terms of obviously what it is you do, um, and I know you've spoken a, a lot with a lot of businesses as well in the past um, about the lived experience of the menopause. So what has been your interpretation of how businesses have been approaching women who are reaching that stage in their life? Um, I think the most important word um, that comes across through all my work that I've done. And, 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 and let's be very clear here. Um, I have spoken yes to a lot of corporations, but I also, as I say, have this massive platform on social media. The most important word is relatable. And I think that if you, because every woman's experience is different, let's be very clear about that. Um, as, as, as Bev said, a quarter of women don't have, I mean, my mum, God bless her, said, um, I, uh, I went through the menopause uh, to my father because he said that she never did. Um, and she said, I did, I did. I, I went through it when I went to visit Emma in South Africa. And I said, that was for two weeks, mum. You know, so she, everybody's, my mum evidently, didn't go through the menopause or, or she did, but she didn't get any symptoms, but it's being relatable. I think it's a matter of, um, I mean, I use personally self-deprecating humor. Um, both my books that I've written about are my life just being one big cataclysmic disaster where I, you know, I forget to take my seatbelt off when I get out of the car. I've taken the dog to the vet and left the dog at home, dropped the kids off at school, got home and the kids are still in the car. Um, and I found ways to laugh at that and then share it with my followers. And people have written to me and said, wow, 
I can so relate to this. And that word relate is so important. Um, so for, for a business, I think what's really important, um, and it's and, and, and yes, putting policies in and um, obviously training is fantastic, but to encourage women to come forward and talk, find spaces, find um, places, find people that are there that you can go and chat to. And it's not just about um, anecdotal um, things where, where women can share things. That's what I, I, I do on my platforms is I share my experiences of, and, and some of them are hilarious, some of them not so hilarious. I'm, I'm, I keep it very, very real. But it's about knowing that there is somebody there up. It's almost like, okay, I'm gonna simplify this. Um, a first aid person, you know that if you cut yourself or you feel like you're having some kind of heart attack, you know a first aid person to go to, that you almost have menopausal advocates who you can go and chat to and say, look, I'm feeling like this, I'm feeling like that. Do it, as preempt it, be um, proactive rather than just reactive. And for that person to be educated well enough to say, do you know what, there's a really strong possibility that you are perimenopausal. And that's great. That's no problem because I've got a whole armory here of things that I can help you with, whether it's how to attack your GP. And I don't mean physically attack them, by the way, although many menopausal women would take a shovel to them. I'm joking. Um, but yeah, how to attack your GP, how to approach it, how to talk about it, how to recognize the symptoms, how to, and, and, and actually talk about it in a really meaningful way and a compassionate way. You don't want to patronize the lady. Um, as I said, it's not a disease. It's, it's a massive gateway to an, an amazing time of your life. Um, and so that's what I would be doing. I would be opening that conversation, normalizing it and making it relatable so that that lady doesn't feel like I don't want to go and talk to that person because I don't want to admit that I'm menopausal. I think it's really important for the company to have an ethos that they understand that menopause is a natural phase. It's not an old lady's disease. It's a release. It's going to be tough, but you've got solutions. And as a business, you can offer solutions, whether that be education or private menopause care or just somebody who knows what they're talking about and gets it. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Have you anything you want to add just off the back of that, Bev? Um, I think Hannah summed that up brilliantly, actually, that relatability is important. I think that one of the questions that I get asked most is how on earth do I start a conversation without offending? without upsetting somebody. Well, I think there's two things at play here. First of all, the big thing for me, and this may sound a little bit harsh, is as women, we have got to make it easier for our colleagues to be able to mention the word menopause without taking offence or feeling ashamed in any way. It's not a shameful event. It's very much a natural part of every woman's life cycle. But I see, still see women saying to me, well, oh, I'd be, I'd be I'd be so angry if somebody mentioned menopause and suggested I was menopausal. I think, well, why? Why would, you know, that, that doesn't make sense. I kind of get it, but it doesn't make sense. It certainly doesn't make it easier for our colleagues to talk about it. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say is I think if I, I use four C's because in my mind, I have to keep things very simple. And the four C's that I think if you keep in mind, you can, you can kind of have any conversation if you keep these four in mind. First is communicate. If we don't communicate, it stays a stigma and it stays a taboo. So even if you say the wrong thing, better say the wrong thing from the right place than say nothing at all. The second is compassion. If we actually approach any conversation with a sense of compassion, <laughs> even if we get it wrong, the, the, the meaning behind it is well-intentioned. And get curious, ask questions, find out, don't make assumptions, don't bring your own experience to the table. I'm not suggesting that you can't empathize through your own experience, but get curious, find out what's going on for that individual because we're all unique. And the fourth one, of course, from a business point of view is confidentiality. Uh, if somebody does open up, that's not for public consumption unless that person says, yeah, I don't mind everybody knowing mm -hmm. there's got to be confidentiality. So I think if we have those four C's in mind, anytime we have a conversation, we're probably not going to go far wrong, but the conversation has to be had at all levels. 
No, absolutely. And, you know, obviously, as part of the HR community, this is something that we really want to ensure that we're supporting businesses on. So what do you what do you feel are perhaps the barriers as to why there hasn't been maybe as much of a focus on um, this particular point of um, the journey for for women who experience or for people who experience menopause? What do you think some of the barriers are actually for the businesses as to why they haven't been a bit more proactive of it? Lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of awareness. With the greatest will of the world, women don't know what they're going through. So businesses are hard pushed. So awareness is key, I think, and a lack of awareness. There's been some amazing work being done in the last 18 months with you know, a lot of high profile celebrities coming forward and talking about their struggles. So it's raised the profile. Um, I think also the fact that, you know, women are going to feel, uh, are likely to feel reluctant to, to own up that they're having problems if they've had to really kind of fight their way up their career ladder already. And they've, you know, with, with the best will in the world, women still aren't fully equal in the workplace. It is harder. We have to work harder to get to those higher levels. And if we have worked our way up the, the career ladder, it's going to take a, a, a lot of courage to actually put your head above the parapet and say, actually, I'm struggling here and I need some help. Um, that, that's a brave thing to do. So we've got to make it we've just got to make it easier for women to feel safe uh, that they're not going to be disadvantaged, not going to be overlooked. They're not going to be um, pushed aside for promotions or, or, or different projects. Um, but I think that, that, that there's a couple of barriers there, societal barriers biases in the workplace um, and, and a lack of awareness. Absolutely. Um, Emma, if, is there anything that you want to add from that, from, you know, from people that you've spoken to or any of the experiences that you've had shared with you from any of the people who you've spoken with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Bev's, Bev's hit the nail on the head. It, it, it's a it's a total lack of understanding, and and I, I was extremely fortunate um, uh, last year. I worked for nine months for a, um, a six men that that's five six menopausal um, consultants from Harley Street, um, and I learned so much about what was going on in my body just in that nine months. I became a complete sponge. And, but what absolutely threw me were the myths that are out there that need so badly to be busted. Um, so yeah, I think the barriers have been a total lack of understanding, um, the stigma, um, which is there, which needs to be removed now. It's, it, 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 the time is now and it's so easily done and I'm proving it on a daily basis just by being Emma. <laughs> Um, and and, and you're, you're not going to see a great deal of Emma this morning, but you, well, one day you will, hopefully. But I learned so much about what is going on in a woman's body and how it can be stopped, how actually they can be the best versions of themselves. And that was not available. That was not available. And, and, and people didn't understand. Now, as exactly as Bev said, it's almost impossible for businesses to understand when the lady themselves don't understand it you know it, it you you've got sort of the, the perfect storm for ignorance so um getting the ladies to understand and if the businesses can bring something to the table for that understanding brilliant they are going to actually actively attract women to their business and women at their best so the barriers have definitely been a lack of understanding the stigma, but also treating menopause as an illness. You know, um, it, it, you don't need to give somebody masses of time off. You need to help them because actually women don't particularly want to have time off. Um, and it shouldn't be a barrier. It should be, let's help them. Let's give them solutions. Let's bust the myths about hormone replacement therapy or various things that we can do towards their mental health, et cetera, and get the best out of our female workforce um which wasn't there before it is there now so let's grab it with both hands it's there it's out there for the taking and it's it's so exciting I mean you, you can hear me I'm I'm ridiculous I'm so enthusiastic about this I think there's another factor as well though that the you know the, the workplace demographics are changing um go back 30 40 years ago and there weren't so many women 
in their menopausal transition, it, it can happen at any age, but for the bulk of us, it's sort of between 45 and 55. Go back 30 years and there weren't anywhere near as many women of that age bracket in the workplace. I think there's been something like a, a 73% increase in women over 50 in the workplace since the, the mid 90s. So the, the demographic in the workplace is changing. Changes to maternity um, benefits 30 odd years ago, changes to pensionable age has meant that women are now either choosing to or feeling they've got no other choice than to work right into their sort of 60s, 70s, and sometimes even into their 80s. So I think historically, it's not been an issue for the workplace because there weren't that many women in the workplace who were going through this. Now, we need to sit up and take notice. There are nearly four and a half million women in that age bracket in the workplace, and 80% of menopausal women are in work. Um, and I'm also conscious that we are talking very much about women here, but it's much more inclusive than that. You know, not everybody that experiences menopause is going to identify as a cis woman. So we've got other factors going on. If we've got trans men, non-binary people, they, they, if they've menstruated at any time, they may experience this. Um, so there's lots of stuff that is, is changing. And I think the barriers are coming down. And the number of organizations that we're now starting to see that are doing something proactively to support menopause. And the fact that I'm looking at the participant numbers, we've got 82 people on this call talking about menopause, that things are changing and they're changing for the better. And the more we do this, the, the, the more those barriers come down. Absolutely. So then my next question to you, I guess to you both is what, do businesses need to be doing to start that conversation and to actually help encourage this? Um, you know, what, what do you think are the main things that we as HR need to be taking away and taking back to, in terms of conversations with our business leaders? Well, as a trainer, it's quite obvious. I'm going to say raise awareness through training. And that's not, that's not um, a, a plug in any way. I genuinely find that just having, having you know, we've got the beauty of the technical virtual world now you can reach a lot of people in one go and it's very cost effective just to get a bit of awareness out there and that opens the door to the conversation now whether you do that by bringing in somebody like me or just getting somebody from HR or somebody who's experiencing menopause who's happy to talk about their story onto a call it starts the conversation I think the most important thing is that we start to be aware of it we can do things like we put policies in place and we can you know have have poster campaigns and things but conversation getting people talking is probably the most important thing that an organization can do and the rest can fall out of that mm -hmm. because as soon as you start the conversation the floodgates open and women feel safe to talk oh my words you will see them talk they will start to talk and they will share their stories and that can help to forge that depending on the culture of the organization that will kind of drive the direction of well, what do we do next but opening the conversation in whatever means that that takes I think is absolutely fundamental mm -hmm. and you mentioned as well you know it's more than just maybe policy um it's more about creating that culture of a safe space um so you know I'll put this out to both of you again as well is um what are some of the practical tips that you would say would help initiate that conversation with the leaders um, rather than just, you know, we want to obviously create more conversation, but what are some of the practical ways that we can do that that are going to really get buy in and understanding from our leaders? Would you like me to field that one, Bev? Are okay. you happy? Yeah. Um, in, in my mind, um, having worked in various different corporations um, and as a menopausal woman, um, I would love it if my manager um, or my HR um, director or HR manager, first of all, um, had knowledge of what or how menopausal symptoms present themselves. Um, I would like them to be um, observant of perhaps behavior change, um, a lady that would normally be buoyant, happy, confident, um, out there pushing, ambitious, who suddenly starts to withdraw um, to actually observe that and kind of make a mental note of that. And maybe even invite that lady for a coffee or do you wanna come in and have to, into my office for a chat, talk about anything and nothing, and then just bring up, you know, notice you're just not quite yourself at the moment. Have you ever considered 
this thing that everybody's talking about. And, and do you know what? We do, it used to be called the change. Um, it's now called the menopause. We don't, we, we stick labels on everything, but perhaps that your hormones are um, in, out of balance or out of kilter. Um, do, you, do you think that that might be, the, do, you, do you have, do you sleep properly? Um, even maybe don't mention the menopause. Um, ask them if they're sleeping okay, because may, maybe you want, um, you know, to, to suggest that, you know, you'd had a bad, or the manager had a, a bad night's sleep, or do you ever find yourself feeling really anxious? And actually find, knowing the symptoms that are perimenopausal. And for this lady to just suddenly start hearing, once again, I'm going back to that word relatable. Yes, 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 I'm feeling all these things. And then for the HR person or whoever that person may be, their line manager to say, do you know what, maybe it's time to go and see a GP because this is really natural. Um, this is something that a friend of mine went through or, you know, if, if it's a chap or somebody who's in their early 20s, you know, if, if, if they're not able to actually relate personally or be able to be personal about it. A friend of mine went through this and this really helped them. Um, I couldn't help but notice because actually I've noticed it with, with loads of other people and with lots of my friends or whatever it may be, but make it personal. And also try, when I say try not to take it too seriously, the best form in my mind of approaching a menopausal lady is self-deprecating humor. Make someone feel comfortable by putting yourself down a little bit, getting your, yourself on the back foot so that they are leaning forward. I don't, does that make sense? So um, you mean it's about being uh, making sure that you're creating a personable space where there can be a, a kind of free exchange of dialogue? Um, yeah, yeah, well, open up? yeah. Um, I think once again, going back to the fact that the lady might not even realize, but to be to, to first of all be educated to know what you're talking about um there is there's an array of symptoms um and i would love the opportunity to talk to any business about that i mean the most extraordinary from tooth loss hair loss um anxiety lack of sleep i mean broken sleep is possibly one of the worst and and anybody that suffered from broken sleep going into the workplace whether you're 21 or 81 it's awful but it's very much a menopausal symptom. So yes, it's about creating that relatable space, but also leading into, you will know your staff. There will be one member of staff that you can say, you know, do you think possibly you're going through exactly the same thing as me? Are you possibly menopausal? You can have that direct conversation. And then you will have someone who's a little bit shy, shy more retiring, possibly needs to be dealt with a little bit more with kick gloves. So just to chat to them and say, you know, um, do you feel any sense of anxiety, but just feeling your way through it but it's knowledge the knowledge is power but it's relatable it's about treating that person with compassion and understanding um and and, and starting that conversation you'd be amazed at how women can go from being a little bud of terror to just blossoming just because you get it and i think that's really really important is knowing your people but knowing of the best way to approach it and there, and and there really are ways you can do that that can get the woman talking and then and then the conversation started um and job done no well, job, job done but beginning of journey begun it's fabulous i've watched it a thousand times and it's it's a joy it's a joy to watch i think that's so true if you've got uh it's about empathy. It's actually about just teaching managers to manage people. And often managers don't manage people. They manage things and forget yeah. that there are people doing the things. I think sort of at a higher level than that, almost going the step before you get to the point where you're training your managers. Sometimes the hardest part for HR is to get buy-in from the SLT or from the, you know, the senior leadership team. And that is fundamental. It's got to start at the top and come down, especially for women who are at the senior levels, but maybe not quite board level, who need to be able to step up and, and say, look, I, I, I need your support here. And I think the way, the best way to do that, I think you, you've got to hit, you know, you've got to, you've almost got to focus on what the board are really interested in. And that's going to be, you know, about profitability and bottom line and all of the, the kind of the business stuff. But just looking at the, the, the financial stats, looking at the, the reality of the fact that, you know, you lose, you lose somebody at the top end of the, their career, you know, a, a senior female manager 
it's likely to cost you double her salary to replace her and you're losing all of that experience and knowledge so hit you know hitting the numbers in there um also there's i mean the stick and carrot isn't there um and i think i much prefer the carrot <laughs> much prefer look it's going to be great for your employer brand it's great for sort of reputationally you're going to attract better people you're going to retain your best people that's great but there is a space for the stick as well and sometimes making the board realize that actually if we get this wrong we are we are in real danger of ending up at tribunal and that is something nobody wants let's get this right before that happens um let's look at you know the the um what are other organizations doing are we lagging behind are we going to be seen as failing because everybody else is moving on um, and, and accepting and embracing menopause as a workplace subject and we're not so i think getting buy-in from the slt is really difficult sometimes if you've got women on the on the board trying to get them on board um is great but male allies finding men on you know at higher levels who are who can be allies and really mm. speak up for us because we're in danger if we're not careful mm. of it just being sounding like a whole load of women whinging about their menopause when in actual fact it's not that it's much broader than that's much bigger than that so i'm sorry that wasn't probably very practical but i think that's you know that's a great place to start is let's get buy-in at the top and if that means throwing the stats around and throwing the figures and getting people to sit up and listen to the costs or potential costs i think you know that's a starting point yeah no absolutely and again that's something that's obviously very very relevant for us as an hr community to um, understand as well needing to speak our leaders languages to try and get our point across um, I'm conscious of time ladies so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go over to Sophie because we have had uh, some questions coming in we've had some direct ones uh, coming as well so Sophie I'll just pass over to you yes uh, thank you very much that's been really interesting so far um, we've had a question here how do we ensure we're being inclusive and mindful in relation to our trans community who may be going through this? I'd love thoughts on how best to communicate and write policies with this in mind. There's very little data actually out there about the impact of hormonal changes through menopause on the, um, on the, the trans community. There are some, uh, there has been some work done. So if you look on Google and put uh, tra trans uh, people and menopause, I'm trying to think, this is my menopause of brain. I hadn't got this question in my head ready. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the website, but there is a really good website that's got a lot of data on there. Well, a lot, as much as there is available. Um, in terms of how to be inclusive, don't shy away from talking about it. You know, put it in the policy. Channel 4 actually have got a very, very good policy that's open source on the internet. So if you Google Channel 4's menopause policy, it's quite as Channel 4 is, it's quite open, it's quite modern, it's quite upbeat, it's not too formal, but it, it's very inclusive. So that's not a bad place to start to go and look. Great, thank you. Um, another question here, how do you get buy-in from a senior leadership team and the organisation when the workforce are majority under 30 and don't think it applies to them? Do you want me to take that one as well, Emma? Or do you want to yes, go ahead? please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I think, again, it, it, this isn't a sales pitch, but awareness training. We know that menopause can hit at any age. We know that it can be brought on, as Emma said earlier, in her own case, early because of surgery, because of um, cancer treatments can bring it on. It's absolutely not an age specific topic. So, again, getting it out there that it's it's not an old woman's disease. It, it, it can happen at any age. It, everything kind of comes back to communication and awareness, doesn't it? <laughs> it seems like a bit of a broken record, but genuinely just making people more aware and breaking down assumptions and stereotypes. And if you do that through a policy or guidelines or maybe a, a page, a, a menopause dedicated page on an internet site that people can just go and visit, I would have probably avoid calling it menopause. I'd probably call it something like women's reproductive health because actually it can it can affect women at any age. And then we've got other things that, you know, pregnancy, infertility, some of the other sort of female related issues like endometriosis, PCOS, all of those, they're all hormonal, they're all interlinked. So actually it takes away the label of menopause and makes it much more open to 
people of all ages. And, and sorry, just I, I, I shied away from that, which is very naughty of me. Um, but yes, um, just to point out to the senior leadership team that yes, they may have um, staff that are um, in their 30s or that sort of age. They are going to hit the menopause at some point. And I guess the aim is to retain your staff for as long as possible, your staff turnover being as low as possible is the best. Um, they are, you know, as I say, women in there, and I've just seen a comment come up that a lady was totally unprepared at the age of 33. Um, weirdly enough, um, menstruation and puberty has shifted by about seven years in the last 30 years. So that means that menopause is actually happening to women earlier. So yes, um, from the senior leadership team, be um, proactive rather than reactive. And who's to say that you're not going to take on a, an amazing woman in her mid forties um, who's going to lead the way um, or even you know ch champion it? Um, why would you not? Um, that that would be my question. Why not? There's no, there's no harm in it because in fact what you're doing is providing solutions. It's not all about just sort of pat, 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 stroke, 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 you'll be fine. No, it's finding solutions. And, and, and as Bev said, it's all about mental health as well. The menopause and mental health is so interlinked. So um, why, you know, the question would be to me, how do you get buy-in? Why would you not do this? Right. Just picking up on that, what would you suggest are some of the solutions? What are the practical things we can do to help women in the workplace? And then the same token, what can women do to help themselves? Can I field this one really quickly? Yeah, can, yeah. Just from um, all my um, all my time spent with um, these Harley Street doctors. Um, first of all, HRT, um, an amazing product. Ninety five percent of women can take HRT safely for the rest of their lives. Um, it is safe. It is protective. It protects your heart. It protects your bones. Weirdly enough. It protects you from early onset dementia. Um, and so bust that myth. Um, as, as an HR director or as an HR manager, um, I would definitely have that in your back pocket. Um, you know, if the lady is sitting in front of you saying, what do I do? What do I do? I feel awful. I'm anxious. I'm tired. Um, have you spoken about H H HRT? And I can absolutely guarantee that let's just say she has been to see her GP, her GP will have poo-pooed that and they would have sent them off and said, you are depressed, you are anxious, diazepam, zopiclone, um, and they will be addicted and it won't work because, um, or, you know, citalopram or whatever. Um, it's hormone replacement treatment. And it's also saying, right, if you're not getting any help from your GP, get the person within that GP practice who deals with women's health, who specializes in women's health. But yes, hormone replacement therapy, if they can't do that because they can't take that because of some kind of cancer or any other health conditions, which are fairly rare, by the way, um, then it's taking them possibly to a menopause specialist or asking them to get referred to a GP. There are so many solutions out there now. There really are. Yeah. And this does not have to be the worst time of your life. That's the reality. And that is something that an HR person can be saying to the lady who's suffering. Um, yeah. I think there so are a few things there, actually, Anna. You're absolutely right. But many organisations have access to employee assistance programmes. If you've got an EAP that's got access to GP helplines or to counsellors, cognitive behavioural therapy can be helpful for, for menopause. So tapping into your occupational health, tapping into your AAP, tapping into things like Able Futures who offer mental health support. There, you know, from a workplace point of view, there are places that you can, you know, quite cost effectively as an organisation put in place that bypass the need to go through the NHS GP system, which as Emma has quite rightly said, is woefully um, under under trained for dealing with menopause um, so yeah tap into to what you've already got and, and enable your managers to be able to tap into those and actually if you're able to give people access to occupational health without a line manager referral that's even better I know that's not always easy but that can often enable women to bypass the the embarrassment of speaking to a manager and just go straight to where they need the help 
Yeah, and, and I would add in there um, menopausal specialists um, that are, you know, specifically trained and run private practice, if you can direct women, um, even if you contribute towards the cost of that. Um, I mean, you're looking at anything between 150 to 200 pounds for a 45 minute session. They don't even have to leave the workplace. It's all it can all be done virtually. And that is a game changer for so many women. Um, and I, I can say that with absolute confidence from my work with um, the menopause consultancy that I work for. Um, but also with the platform of women that I deal with um, on a daily basis. If you can get your lady in front of a or on the phone for a 45 minute session with a menopause consultant, game changer. I've noticed, can I, I, I need to shoot at 10, I'm afraid. And I noticed a couple of um, particularly work-based questions in the, in the chat. Are you okay if I address those really quickly? Yeah, um, one of them was about the Equality Act and Health and Safety Act. The, there is protection already there at the moment. Menopause isn't a protected characteristic. There are plans afoot to change that. I had a really good conversation with an employment law specialist um, last week. She was under the impression that we didn't need it, uh, that there's enough protection in the law already. Personally, my own thoughts are, we know that it's protect protected under age, sex and disability. It's not an age specific topic. It's not a sex specific topic. And I'm a menopausal woman that would not want to be labeled disabled. So actually, I don't believe there's enough protection there, but I'm not an employment law specialist. The other question was, was around reasonable adjustments. What do reasonable adjustments look like? It's too broad to be able to say, well, this is this is what a reasonable adjustment should be for a menopausal person, because we've got more than 35 different symptoms that are very diverse. But simple things looking at start and finish times, work from home, flexible working, um, the obvious one, letting somebody have a fan, but regular toilet breaks, not having to put your hand up and say, can I go to the toilet again? You know, making it easy, having quiet areas so somebody can go and decompress if they're having a moment or if they're having a hot flush. Like thinking about uniform policies, are your uniform policies likely to be restrictive? Because actually that could be quite discriminatory if you've got a uniform policy that isn't flexible enough for somebody who's having hot flushes to be able to maybe take a tie off or whatever. So actually asking the individual what would help them is probably the best place to start with reasonable adjustments. Um, and give your managers enough autonomy to be able to put measures in place without having to jump through a whole number of hoops just to be able to do that. Um, I'm very, very conscious. I'm, I'm going really quickly. I've got, I'm actually delivering a menopause, um, a free web, introduction to menopause in the workplace webinar at 10 o'clock. Um, if I may just say, if anybody does want to kind of connect with me linkedin is my is my most sort of um prolific place if you like just look at bev thurgood on there um and thank you so much for inviting me along sorry to hit cut and run but uh good luck with everybody's uh, menopause journey i'm sticking around guys <laughs> I, I don't have a life <laughs> So thank you so much for that, Bev. We do appreciate you uh, giving your time this morning. And thank if you, you. Have to, take to care, dive, everyone. Please, Bye, Bev. Bye, Bev. Bye. Have we got time? Do we have time for one more question, Fiona? Should we could we probably do one more. Also, just to say, um, I noticed a few people were asking in the chat about contact details. Um, we are happy to um to to share around um Emma and Bev's contact details um after this session. So um, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear from anyone. <laughs> Seriously, my, my, my ethos um, on my page um, and even with my books is about making a difference. Um, and, and it's so easy. I can't tell you. It, it, it is so easy. It sounds complex. It sounds scary. It sounds, oh, I would imagine there would be men going sort of curling up into a ball into their bunker. It's so <laughs> easy. I promise. I've done so much research into this. And look, I smile. I smile and, and I bring some joy to this. And I think there has to be some joy brought to this. So, yes, please do get in touch um, because I love delivering these things. It, 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 and I can absolutely guarantee that people, I don't think there's one person that's walked away from listening to me talking utter nonsense, but sense as well that's felt worse. So I think it's really all about um, providing solutions, being positive, and it's not an illness. We can do this. And if you're a company who embraces not only the menopause, but you actually 
provide solutions, you are understanding and compassionate, you're going to bring in the best women in the world into your workplace and you're going to keep them there. Right, thank you. I think this last question and probably ties in quite nicely with what you've just said there. Is it practical to run training for men and women together or would it be more effective to run them separately? I I think that's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think that's for the individual. I mean, obviously we're focusing on ladies here um, as in the employee. And I would say that you could do sets of three perhaps. Personally, I think that having men involved is invaluable, absolutely priceless because for them to understand what the ladies are going through is so important for them and for the ladies but it's once again it's whether or not ladies feel comfortable with sharing what they're going through because there are some symptoms of the menopause that are what women would perceive as embarrassing um i don't see them as that because i talk about them all the time but it depends on how comfortable they are openly discussing what they're going through in front of guys so perhaps i th- i think it, once again it's knowing your workforce so if um you have a very small workforce and they're very comfortable with having men involved in fact they would actually encourage that then definitely men and women if they if they feel that they would like to have a chat with someone say for example someone like me um where i would just talk and they could ask questions that's something i like to do i far prefer it to be interactive where they get to just ask me anything and i I have i have a wonderful expression no holds barred rather than no holds barred um isn't that terrible um (laughs) but um i know it's an emerism but you know, if they just want to have a chat with me or, you know, chat with any kind of menopause specialist or whatever, and, and, and they want to be able to talk about things that they don't want men involved in. But then I would, yeah, I would encourage um, guys to get involved. It's a, it's understanding. And it's not, as I said, oh God, I've said this a thousand times. It's not an illness. And, and there is no side door, by the way. We can't chuck a grand at them and say, right, you get to go through this little side door and avoid the whole thing. It's not like that. We've got to go through this. So we may as well make it the best experience ever. And if that means that men and women understand one another, and, and especially the men understand what the women are going through, and, um, and the women know that the men understand, you're halfway there. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that reached the end of the session I think we were there for the question so Fiona do you want to do a little wrap up uh, yes off? yeah so just thank you everyone for joining and taking the time out of your morning to come and join our session and um, hopefully you found it very um, informative I know there's been a lot of um, sessions kind of out there about about menopause and um, hopefully this one was able to kind of give you um, maybe a, a different um, a different context or a different uh, viewpoint on what we can be doing to understand um, those individuals better and what we can be doing to support our business managers so thank you very right, much I just say one thing before I everybody goes um, I am utterly hopeless with LinkedIn I can work it a bit it's a little bit like reversing a car for me mm-hmm. but um, I have got an email address um, my platforms on social media are on Facebook and Instagram menopausal mayhem mothers so you can always contact me on there um, and um, yeah uh, the, uh, these beautiful ladies um, Fiona and Sophie are going to um, dish out email addresses so yeah by all means contact me by email I'm never far from my laptop so yeah link but if if you do contact me on LinkedIn it is um Emma Skeets um but uh you might have to give me a, a, a bit of a shove with a broom because um, I'm, I'm not very good scream at me can you scream on LinkedIn I don't know <laughs> We can give it a try. Thank you so much, Emma, for giving your time and talking to us this morning. Absolute pleasure. Really it's great to meet you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day.